Now, you know, quite frankly, until I taught this course, I, I couldn't have given the answers either. One of the joys of teaching this kind of physics is it forces you, as a capable person, to look up numbers, to look up the numbers and learn them, and you get fascinating things. When I looked it up, I discovered that gasoline has 15 times the energy of TNT. 15 times more. 1,500%. Of course that makes sense. You don't use TNT because it has lots of energy. We use TNT because it releases it rapidly. And that gives you power. So TNT has more power. And I use this as a way of teaching the difference between power and energy. It also explains to me, and I explained to the class, why it's so hard to break our addiction to automobiles. This stuff has so much energy in it. Now, even chocolate chip cookies have nine times the energy of TNT. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, if you'd like to blow up a car and get one pound to do it, you could take a pound of TNT, or you could take a pound of chocolate chip cookies, give it to some teenager with sledgehammers and get far more destruction. <laughs> But this is talking about energy and having a vivid image. I find that all it takes to have a vivid image is to have something that's important. And on the first day of the class, I announce to my class, I say to them, because, because I tell them this that forces me to do it, that if I ever give a lecture in which you walk out saying, why do we need to know that? Then it's not your fault. It is my fault. Now, they, they only take one semester of physics. And because they only take one semester of physics, um, they, they, they're going to be exposed to only, only a little bit. And as I said, you want to light fire. So how do you light fire? I, I one time signed up for a history class. And the uh, professor said, to my heart, that we would read a thousand pages a week. And I didn't know whether I could do that or not. I can't read that fast. And I asked him, I said, you said a thousand pages a week. And uh, he didn't tell us what we should read. And he said, if you read a thousand pages a week, it doesn't matter what you read. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a problem in your class because I can't read a thousand pages a week. I'm a slow reader. Uh, but it was a fascinating thought. If you expose someone to one semester or one year of physics in which they are engrossed, in which they believe it's important, they will learn physics. Uh, and, and they, will, they will be exposed to it and you'll get that fire ignited. It's wonderful that my students come back to me years afterwards and tell me the stories. But your goal, it doesn't matter what you teach. Some people say, oh, you've got to teach the scientific method. And, uh, boy, there's nothing in my opinion that is more mistaught than a scientific method. And someone who's been deeply engaged in research for decades, I finally figured out what the scientific method is. And it's not the one I was taught in high school. I'm going to give you a let, let, let me tell you what I think the scientific method is. The scientific method uh, makes an observation that the non scientist is easily fooled and even fools himself. Herself, forgive my sexism here. Okay. A scientist, in contrast, is easily fooled and even fools himself and knows it. <laughs> and takes extraordinary measures to overcome that self deception. That's the essence of the scientific method. It's that you know you are prejudiced, you know you write yourself to turn out some way, you behave in such a way with cross checks, with other people coming in and criticizing you by encouraging criticism. I, I was, I became, I, I, I became the protege of the great physicist Louis Alvarez simply because I was willing to challenge him. And boy, he was looking desperately for someone who would give him a hard time because that's what he needed because that is the scientific method. Um, so how do I teach the scientific method? I don't. I, you can teach the scientific method by them seeing the way I think about things, the way I handle things, the way I handle issues, the way I admit things I don't know. I had a, I had a physics colleague who said, if you teach them nothing else, teach them just this. So here I was, you know, waiting for the plastics. <laughs> and it came. He said, resonance. <laughs> If these students learn nothing else other than 
residence, then you will have accomplished a lot. By the way, my goal was different. I would walk into class every day. I would really do this. I would I'd, I'd, I'd be about to enter, I'd stand there, and I'd say, in today's things, what is it that I would be doing? What is it that 20, 30 years from now, when one of those students is president of the United States, what is it that I will regret not having taught that student? What is so important that I want the president to know, and here's my one chance to teach that person? And I, I do this every time. And I usually say, oh, of course. And then I would go out. And in my lecture, that thing would come up many times. And repetition, as you all know, is one of the best ways to teach anything. So, um, I'll actually talk for most of my talk, but I'm still getting my slides. <laughs> uh, let's, let's just grab that a little bit. Okay, so, so there's the name of the course. That's the textbook. Uh, textbook, when I wrote it, it was originally notes for the class, and then I put them together in a textbook because my real goal was to leave as a legacy of the course. I don't want it to be Rich Muller's class that only Rich can teach and when he goes away. Uh, it was inspired by Alex Filipenko, who taught the astronomy class, and he was getting great, great, great people signing up for astronomy. Uh, why astronomy? Why did anybody think astronomy? Well, he had to take some physical sciences, and he was a great lecturer. That's what everybody will say about why someone takes a course. Oh, he's a dynamic lecturer. Well, it's, it's often true. But is that why they really take it? When I first started taking, teaching this class, the enrollment was, was I believe, uh, it was 45, and I was told that 10 or 15 of them would drop out after the first month. Um, but Alex was getting 900. What's going on here? So I went to Alex to ask him, what, show me your course. And he showed me the material, I gave you all the material, I looked over, I said, oh my God, this is a revelation. He's teaching a lot of material. There is content to his class, much more so than in the very low enrollment physics class, in which it got watered down semester after semester after semester. It just got watered down. I thought, wow. Wow. Let me stick, fill this course with content. And I did. It's almost too much. But it's what draws the students in. Um, this was the enrollment when I took over. Then dropped. Why did it drop? Because there were these other courses you could take. You could take, you could, I mean, you, you, you could take uh, astronomy, you could take anthropology, physical anthropology, that counts for your physical sciences, a geography, history, topic from the history of physical sciences. This is what you can do to get out of taking physics. <laughs> Back when physics was the only course, uh, everybody took it. But uh, pretty soon there were alternatives. Oops, oh, that's what happened there. Okay, so there we are, and when the enrollment back then, it dropped as soon as there were alternatives. Edward Teller was famous for teaching this course. He filled it up, there were lines waiting to get in. I, I, I wondered what it was. Sometimes he wouldn't even show up, he'd just have a recording. Go, <laughs> I learned the secret from one of his ex-students. It turns out Edward Teller really hated giving grades, so he just gave every single student an A. <laughs> he get away with that. <laughs> anyway, so we started teaching it at first. I didn't know what I was doing, but this is what happened. And pretty soon we were filling up the largest lecture hall um, that, that, that could handle the demonstrations that I did. And, uh, and, and, I, and, and, and the students loved it. And my proudest award ever for anything is when the class was voted the best class on the Berkeley campus. A physics class? The best class on the Berkeley campus? And some of my football players, one of my football players won this big award. Uh, I'm Alex Mack, and he was the best student scholar in the country, and, and got this award. And go up and interview him and say, So, what are your favorite course classes? And he says, Well, I like physics. Got headlines everywhere. Football player loves physics. I was baby. <laughs> anyway, let, let, let me. Oh, uh, start with this in the first week, everything for ground. I had taught this, but we we'll, we'll go down and look. Look at batteries compared to gasoline. It's a hundred times more energy in gasoline than in batteries. Who killed the electric car? Well, physics and chemistry. <laughs> I don't believe we're ever going to drive all electric cars. 
I go into that in great detail. I have a new book coming out on energy and physics present. Future presidents. Actually, this book actually talks a lot about why we will never have electric cars. Interesting thing. I can, I can say all sorts of contentious things. But the only people who get really furious are the electric car lovers. <laughs> well, that really is a religion. But, uh, let's see. Okay, this is more interesting. TNT and gas. When I mentioned that factor of, of 15, I taught this. Went home for the weekend, and then something happened in New York City on 9-11. Next day, I came into my class. Most of the students were there. I said, change of lecture. We'll talk about something different today. Let's talk about the physics of what happened yesterday. And as you know, my wife had asked me. She said, well, how did they get the explosives into the plane? I said, no, 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 they don't need explosives. They have gasoline. It's 15 times the energy of TNT. And I went to the class and I said, as you know, gasoline is 15. And I said, based on this, I told my wife, I'll bet you it was a transcontinental flight loaded up with gasoline. It turned out to be true. Um, and we were at, well, how do buildings collapse? How do things buckle? Use that as a great opportunity to, use, to, 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 do, to do physics. Um, and then there are the things I showed you. Uh, if you work out the numbers for the energy released by the gas.